set aside for public comment. Do we have any public comment this evening? Uh, then we go into a report from Mr. Norvell. Um, I think I enclosed in your packet an article that was in NCSA today concerning school construction. I just thought it was interesting and I stuck it in your packet for you to, to take a look at. There was also a memo from our attorneys concerning a recent Supreme Court ruling, I think it's called the Candy Cane case. It basically has to do with handing out gifts in schools and just some stuff we need to be aware of. There was a brochure in there on the ESU six career academies. We participated in the career academies for the last three years, but I thought you might take a look at it and make yourself aware of that. And we do have some kids, not many kids, but a few kids that sign up for the career, career academy every year. Do all the students get that brochure or just what they ask for? Uh, well, they should get it during the registration in the spring, so Denise Betts and Mr. Rose should, should get it to them to get them that information. Well, I can see. Um, a little update on school lunch changes. Our, our head cook, Cindy Kennel, and then Bev Molman from the middle school, they attended a workshop this summer. We've been aware of, of the changes that are coming. We weren't sure what kind of changes, but they're really going, if you want to get federal subsidies, which we get about 80,000 in federal subsidies from the federal government for our lunch program through commodities and, and uh, payments back every month, uh, you have to follow this new healthy choice plan in the lunch menu. And just to give you a couple of of changes. Number one, like when we have pizza, it has to be served on wheat crust now. It can't be any white flour. It has to be wheat. Uh, we have to take some of the things off of our salad bar that we've been offering that are high calorie, like ranch dressing. Sometimes Cindy cuts up ham or cuts up bacon bits, and I don't, I know we can't have both of them out there at the same time, so whether we can have one or the other, you know, that's. We'll figure that out, but we've always had like bread and butter out on the salad bar for kids that didn't like the entree. Well, we can't do that. The bread and butter has to be wheat bread and peanut butter. That has to be behind the counter, and if, we, and if the kid doesn't like the entree, they can request the peanut butter sandwich. So, you know, we're going to send, we always send a free and reduced lunch letter to all parents the first week in August. We're also going to include a letter of all the changes in the in the lunch program and it could cause more kids to bring their lunch. Uh, we have to watch calories. I was telling Sean earlier, I think you know, Cindy up here at the high school, our boys, she always gave them like eight chicken nuggets. Well, you're limited to five, uh, things like that because eight has too many calories in eight of them. And there's a lot less breading now on the chicken nuggets, which I, I bring up chicken nuggets because it's one of the kids' favorite meals here at, at the school. So. There will be some, some changes, and we're going to try to be proactive and get those changes out to the, to the community you know, prior to the start of school. We'll also have the same article on our website about the lunch changes 
uh, and also uh, have it in the newsletter. But we're also going to send every parent an actual letter telling them the changes. So, so then you can't go back for seconds either, then? You can go back for seconds. you got to pay. We, we, a lot of times, if we had food left over, just let kids but come I mean, back for seconds. Because of the new rules. New rules, you can go back for seconds, but it's 50 cents. So, yeah, you can have that extra three chicken nuggets, but you can't just give it to them for what's in the So, if yeah, they want extra calories, they're paying for them. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't take part in it, if we don't get the subsidies, yeah. So, we're kind of Well, if you, you know, if we want to supplement our lunch fund on 80000 and forget about the feds. We already subsidize at thirty thousand a year. We can't make ends meet the way it is, so we need the eighty thousand. And it may go over better than I think, but I just I got two girls pretty picky about what they eat. Now I guarantee you, they'd have brought their lunch every day. So is the government trying to kill the kids or allergic to peanuts or what? Like your peanut butter? It's <laughs> well, you got to have an alternative for those that are allergic to. So. We have a little girl at the middle school that this year is diabetic, and so we have to watch her carbs and give her a shot every day at lunch and do some things like that too. So I mean, we have to monitor those things anyway. So I just, you know, you may be the the first wall of catching a few phone calls when things go wrong, but we really don't have a whole lot of choice. And when we send out that letter on the guidelines, I'll make sure you guys get a copy of that. And it, it really, Cindy's got it down pretty much to what. What, what will work and what can't work. We have to turn the menus in every day now. So, to the apartments. They just came out and monitored us maybe two or three times a year. They would come out. They tell you when you're coming. You send them the menu. They, they take the temperature of food and make sure it's the right degrees and things like that. But we have to submit our menus there too. We're going to probably try to use about the same 15 to 20 menus, just recycle them. So just do it over and over again. So we're doing the same thing already with the, with the breads and everything else, taking them off, setting the calories and using that. And they were like, okay, well. So anyway, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the Department of Ed was supposed to adopt their change in July and they postponed it to August, so we're kind of on hold on that. But basically what they're saying is the proposed rule will require each public school district to establish a period of time during the school day when a majority of the students uh, will be led in the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance in the presence of the U.S. flag in grades K-12. Student participation is voluntary. Students not participating in the recitation of the pledge would be permitted to silently stand or remain seated so long as they respect the rights of those electing to participate. Hasn't been adopted yet, but I'm pretty sure it will be adopted. I know that we already did the pledge K-4. I'm not positive what we do in 5 through 8, whether we do it every day or just at times, but I'm positive we don't do it in 9 through 12, so it will be a little bit of a change. But it's something that only takes about a minute, so it's not a, it's not a big deal. We'll, we'll certainly comply with whatever they tell us we need to do. I think there was a letter in your packet. We had a No Child Left Behind review in maybe early June, and I put the results of that in your, in your packet. There should have been a couple of thank yous for two of the girls that got the Mabel <coughs> Edsa scholarship in there. There were some more thank yous that I had out here today from the FBLA students and their instructors in Utali. They were that was in your pile when you got here somewhere. And I think there was a letter today about our accreditation that we're a fully accredited school for the 2012 and 2013 school year. And that was something I just got today and I brought it back. <coughs> so, any questions from anyone? If not this, no. is that it? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're ready for the action. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a motion for the minutes of the June 11th regular board. Move. Second. Second. Moved by Jim and seconded by Dave that the board approve the minutes of the June 11th regular board meeting. Discussion? Roll call?
Donovan? Yes. Asha? Yes. Weinschmidt? Yes. White wine? Yes. Maloli? Yes. Nine yes. Domeyer? Yes. We need a motion for the financial reports. So moved. Yes. Second. Moved by Mark and seconded by Jim that the board approve the financial reports as presented. Discussion? Roll call. Whitewine? Yes. Donovan? Yes. Shell call. Absent. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Malilli? Yes. Nine yes. Oshner? Yes. Delmeyer? Yes. We need a motion for the general fund claims. I will. I'll second. Is that right? Randy. Yes. Randy is. It's moved by Randy and seconded by Jim. The board approved the general fund claims in the amount of $301,171.64. Discussion? The largest claim on there was our quarterly spent payment to ESU 6, and we'll have one. In August, it'll be just for the summer. It'll be a little bit smaller, but it, it, uh, the two hundred eleven thousand dollar payment was the majority of this month's claim. Roll call. Whitewine. Yes. Donovan. Yes. Whitewine. Yes. Maloli. Yes. None. Yes. Oshner. Yes. Demeyer. Yes. Building fund claims. We need a motion. Second. Moved by Mark and seconded by Dave that the board approved the building fund claims in the amount of $4,233.38. Discussion? Elementary playground border. I think it's that white PVC. I pipe that goes around the elementary building, that's the building fund plan. It was approved by the building fund for the building committee last October. Roll call. Lightline? Yes. Oshner? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Maloli? Yes. Nine yes. Donovan? Yes. John Meyer? Yes. Miscellaneous charges schedule. Friend? Yeah. Moved by Jim and seconded by Randy that the board approved the 2012 2013 miscellaneous charges schedule as presented. Discussion? Roll call. Donovan? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Lightwine? Yes. Maloney? Yes. Van? Yes. Oshner? Yes. Delmeyer? Yes. That's the discussion for this next one before we can take a motion in a second. So you see how we have a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the insurance bids, there were two. And uh, kind of on this sheet, I tried to summarize everything the best I could on this on this sheet here that I have, and uh, <clears throat> in the black on this sheet is our current what we pay currently for insurance through Indiana. Um, Stu Seward, Seward is the agent in All American. If you remember, we've had him I think maybe four years, and the uh, Indiana insurance is no longer going to carry Nebraska and Iowa schools. And uh, those were basically the costs of each of the different types of insurance that we get through Indiana. We received today, before noon, two different proposals. Uh, one from Continental Western with Stu Seward and All American Insurance as an agent. And I have the cost listed there uh, with each corresponding uh, insurance types. And then uh, an EMC proposal from Inspro and Cody Lightwine as agent. And Cody's here tonight if you have any questions. And 
basically on the EMC proposal, if you look at it, um, there are two, we could choose from two different types of workers comp there. EMC workers comp is the $26,000 figure, but they would, they could go through a separate company, a separate entity for the workers comp at $22,118 if, if that's what we, we so desired. Part of the part of what I what I've seen as a problem with that is I I hate to be working with a different company for workers comp and EMC would pay us back a dividend if we had a good year where we didn't have a lot of claims they pay a dividend back am I saying that right Cody yes and uh, so it, although although having a separate workers comp I think is a little cheaper I, I guess my feeling is it wouldn't necessarily be the right way to go. I think there's a significant difference between EMC and Continental Western. Here's another major difference. Property insurance, the best Continental Western would offer is a $5,000 deductible. We asked for a $1,000 deductible and that's what EMC is proposing is a $1,000 deductible and the best that Continental Western would do would be $5,000. That's just on the property. Sure. Here to answer any questions if I can. I'm not an insurance guy. Lynn and I read through it today best we could, and the property insurance was the big difference. And I tried to to break everything out there uh, best I could. Cody, I I took the what you had linebacker and data compromise. I just stuck that together and put it with liability on my form. I don't know if that's the right way for it, but I didn't have those were separate categories than what we used before, so I stuck it in there as as an amount, so what is a linebacker? I know what it is in football. I'm not sure what I what it is in insurance. That's their uh, cute company name for directors and officers insurance and professional liability for the board. Like the board. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I, I know what the data compromise is. We talked about that already. So. Yes. So that's probably the right place to put it under liability, correct? Yes. Now our, our current insurance ends at the end of August, so we have it here tonight to make a motion. I'm guessing if you didn't feel comfortable yet choosing, we could probably still do it in August, but... Um, it said that we would, we would do it at the July meeting. We try to do it on a three-year basis. Yeah. What we've been doing, it's been on a three year basis. <coughs> so, is this for three years or it could go on just like that? This is just for one year at this point in time, but what we've been doing is just staying with the same company for three years and then going through the bid process again. With this EDM, they just aren't going to do it. They're not going to do it for Nebraska and Iowa schools. That's, that's what they told me. So. And they really told us late. I, I think I think find out till maybe April. And uh, well, they have to do it 60 days before renewal. They waited till the last minute to do it. Exactly. When they knew they were going to get out of business. They knew it. Four years ago, we had EMC Patrick and Lori Rass with some agents. We paid in this about 75,000 years what we paid. Indiana came in and just kind of underbid. A lot of schools in, in Nebraska and Iowa, and a lot of people jumped to them. And I'm not, I don't know what happened, but I'm guessing they had some catastrophic claims on tornadoes, maybe, or maybe flood from the Missouri River. And they just didn't have enough property coverage to, to take care of it all. I'm guessing. I don't know. But. So, was this 55? Was this three years ago, or is this what we paid? This was this past year. Well, this, was this past year. year. Significant difference, but again, EMC that's about the same price with EMC that we paid four years ago when Patrick Glory had. So they EMC just with they undercut it and they kept it. I mean, I kept it all. We didn't. We didn't have hardly any claims in Stu the last four years. I mean, a couple of vandalism claims maybe, and maybe we had a, bump, a fender bender with the bus, and that's been about it. Like we didn't. 
we didn't file really anything. And he even, he even admitted that he didn't fail at any time. So, so this company too, if the claims are low or non-existent, they will pay money. On the workman's column. Oh, just the workman's column. On the workman's column. Now, what did we get through suit? Is that just workman's contract? He gave us like four times. Yeah, we used to get a dividend back from him too. That's just workman's column. Yeah, if you oh. don't have any, any major. Is that the 4000 that was in the paper a couple months ago? You accepted the check? Mm -hmm. He just that said that it was an insurance dividend. He didn't tell me it was workman's compensation. And so where does that money go when it comes back? Probably under other receipts or budget. Okay. Um, the biggest question I have is more in process, and that is you and Lynn together opened the bids, and nobody else has seen them since. Just this information. Under automobile, is that all the vehicles that you see? That's it. That's everything. It's all the buses. That's not good. Schools, schools have a pretty good yeah. safety history, though. Gee, that's better than that. But not, they're not <laughs> high risk, I would say, Cody, right? That's not a lot of high it. risk. Is they're, they're treated a little bit differently than if uh, Cody has a Corvette um, <laughs> because of the way they're driven. And like you said, good lost experience. And this is called a commercial automobile policy, too. It's not Correct. just a straight like we can get privately. Right. But it was it was cheap for us too too. It was thirty five hundred for all our buses and vehicles. What did Dr. Bull was that? Five hundred. Five hundred. Five hundred. Yeah. Put a few vehicles on there. Have you put that Any idea why the big, to me, the, the, the big discrepancy between the two is the property? Yeah. And you said the, the, the first one was 5,000 in that one? The one from Continental Western is 5,000. The is the house. To me, it should be. Yeah. I know, but I sure you got, I got it right. So, 5,000 deductible on building and contents, no other option, it says in his, and no other option really. And we have the same waste of property. Exactly. Same property. Yeah. Yeah. I will comment that in working with Continental Western on some other business, they did take about a 20 to 25 percent line item increase on property coverages and pushed higher deductibles because they had a lot of wind and hail claims last year. And so their, their pricing uh, has moved up there pretty significantly on the property side. And these were the only two proposals? The only two. Skip. <coughs> uh, the only other company I'm aware of is Columbia. We had Columbia Insurance when I was at Barber. Gave us a Columbia bid. There might be other insurance companies that do schools, but these are the uh, four county Indiana. It's still going to do school insurance, just not going to do it in Nebraska and Iowa. I guess. So, so are we ready for the action? The boards are ready. Are there any other questions about this? I think. I think if, you know, if you make a motion for EMC, you may want to designate how you want to do the workers, work, workers' compensation. If you want to go with the smaller price, which is the SFM. Correct. Do you want to explain that a little bit, Cody, the difference between the workers' comp between the two groups? Okay. Um, the companies typically look at workers' comp as one of the things that they'll let you um, get from another insurance carrier. Uh, by doing that, uh, I, I, the disadvantage I see to it is that when they underwrite your account, they look at the total dollars and claims they've paid out to the total premium they've collected. So if you have a bad loss experience with work comp, but really good property experience, and you're doing business with SFM and EMC, they can't really combine those two things to look at them. 
if you have it all with EMC and you maybe have a, a year where you have bad work comp experience, uh, they're going to look at the account as a whole versus just the piece that they write. Uh, another thing to note, SFM is not rated by AM Best. Um, they, the reason they choose not to be is that that's a service that the insurance company has to pay for. However, they do engage uh, insurance auditing firms in preparing their financials, reviewing their losses, make sure they're a good, stable business, and they're very open and willing to share their financial statement with people. And there's like a four thousand dollars savings. About five thousand, I think. Five thousand. Yeah. And the dividend, uh, in looking at that with the size of the work comp policy that you guys have. The most you could get back would be nine percent of the EMC work comp premium in a year, right? In a year, in a, in a year. That would even be three thousand. Right. You'd be about twenty. I think I figured twenty four, twenty six hundred dollars. Twenty six hundred. Still under that. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I can probably. And I can, you know, I'm comfortable with either company's ability to pay claims in the event of a loss. I think they'll be there. That's the question I have for you. If we go for the, the subcarrier, mm -hmm. and you made the comment that if we turn in a lot of workman's comp, say in the next two years, and we're talking about a four year deal, they could raise that one separate from the other one. I mean, that could go to, instead of 22000 to 48000 if we turn in a lot of claims in the earth. Sure, yep, it could. And, and that, but I guess that's the way I understood what you're yeah, explaining yeah, is it, it could really fluctuate where the other one might not fluctuate. They won't, weigh, they won't weigh in how right. they get on the other side. Right. Yep. So I guess my question is and it can go claims to we, you know, track record the last. We, we've had a few that have been pretty minor. Been, they haven't been real costly. Like I said, with Indiana, we hardly ever filed anything. It can work the other way, too, if you uh, have a hailstorm come through, and let's say that totals the roof on every building that we have insured, but you don't have any work comp claims, and your work comp is with EMC, you know, then they count those premium dollars as part of offsetting that. So it's, it's almost like a set. I'm okay either way. It's it's fine. Yeah, really. Your work comp history has been very good. Um, you're at a 0.82 mod, and what that does is it compares you with risks like yours. Uh, 1.00 is considered average. Above one is worse than average. Below one's better. So what they're telling you is you're 18% better than average or better than what they would expect. And that also generates an 18% credit right off the bat when they figure the premium. That would be for any work comp carrier, whether it be Continental and Western, EMC, correct. SFM doing the work. Do we have a second? Sean? Moved by 
Randy and seconded by Sean. We go with the EMC proposal with the separate company for the workers' call. Discussion. Discussion items. The first item is the superintendent evaluation document. Well, I, I sent it in your packet, I believe, and uh, I had had Dave and Dennis look it over, I think, last month or the month before that, and they gave me some suggestions. So I think the part I like probably the best is the timeline. I think it really you know, spells things out what we do at the October meeting, what we do at the November meeting, and, and so on and so forth, and how the evaluation is placed in my file whatsoever. I think it's just good and good and clear, and that'd be something every October that we'll, you know, we'll go through. As far as the evaluation, and this was, I think, uh, Mr. Klein and I kind of worked on this together. We had, because he wanted one for his new job at Logan View and we've got different samples in and you know you can go through there's a lot of things that are very similar to what we had but when you get to standard eight standard eight is 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 an open-handed one that the board can can agree to what indicators they want to see in the next evaluation as far as improvement of, of performance and so it's it's spelled out there, and I think it would be it would be great. That's that's something that I saw it on my last evaluation and didn't really get a clear picture of. And I and I think this would be you know a way to do that every year is that you know you're going to fill out standard aid and that's going to show you know something for me to work on for the for the upcoming year. So I wanted the board to look at it. Certainly, it'll be it'll be up to you. If, it fits the document that you want to use, but I really like it. I think it's got a little more clarity, and, and I really like the, the timeline. I guess I can agree with you, Mark. You know, we kind of had an issue with this, and we're still not getting the greeting to all of us. So, um, the question I have for you is if you have satisfactory and unsatisfactory, and then you have comments down there. Um, how would you like to see us put comments? Um, if it's unsatisfactory, would you like to have a you know comment that you know most blah 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 whatever? You want to, would you like to be specific for that? And if it's satisfactory, do you want us to you know not make a comment or say you're doing a great job or you know I, like I said I went, I went to that one the, the Lincoln one I, and I like that idea was. Well, if you put here or here, you got to make a comment. If you put in the middle, you didn't have to. I guess that would maybe help us as a board when we sit down at the end of, you know, to find out where we're at, you know, one spectrum or the other. Do we have similar comments on a certain thing? And, and it's something that you need to be able to use too, I mean, to, right. to, to go forward. I, I think the, the, you know, the, way, the way the timeline reads, I'm not going to see all the individual evaluations. You're going to get get together eventually and put them together and come out with one. So you know, to me, the type the type of comments that are going to help me are going to be the ones that the majority of the board can agree upon in each one of these indicators and that. And uh, to me, that's that's what that that is for. And, uh, certainly, I think the comments are helpful, but they're most helpful when it when a consensus of the board agrees that, yeah, you know, this is what he does good and this is what he needs to work on. I think that's that's the part we didn't really... Yeah. Yeah, because last year we had nine different comments and you didn't know where to, which way to go. It makes it hard for you. 
I'm, but I'm going to give. I'm only going to give one evaluation. Right. Right. And that will help then. My thought would be, you, if you put unsatisfactory, you better put a comment, and you, maybe you wouldn't have to if it's satisfactory. But if you think it's extremely satisfactory, like, I guess, I guess then, then, then you could put it. I mean, there's a lot of like I know in our for us, it's a lot of them. You know, discussions. What's that? I said for us it's important to have. I didn't mean to interrupt, but as us as a board, when we sat down, we get This is our discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, you're only going to get one now. Well, I think I think Jim makes a good point. I mean, if you if you check on satisfactory, you ought to have a reason, and you ought to be able to write that out uh, in a comment form. Another thing that I think you need to consider is what what is the term of this evaluation? What are you looking at? Are you looking at the past year? You know, when we evaluate our teachers and principals. It's year to year. We don't go back to this happened three years ago. We do it within within that year, but for most of the time, it doesn't really define that with the superintendent's evaluation either. So, well, since it's an annual evaluation, it would make sense. That it's just for the past year. That's my right. 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 If you check unsatisfactory, if you list the reason, and then we can discuss that and come to a consensus at the board, right. is it really unsatisfactory? Right. And if it is, then we would pass that along to Mr. Mandel. If it's a consensus of the board that it's not unsatisfactory, then I don't see any reason to. Okay, I have make a problem a with consensus because consensus means we all 100% agree. I don't think we're all going to agree on everything. I'm sorry, uh, that's just not real. To me, consensus is if we have eight members of the board and five of us say no, it's not. That's majority, not consensus. Well, then it should be majority. Okay, just so that we understand that it's then not it should be all majority. agree. Because we only have power as a board, not as a board. Right. Yeah, I guess I was looking at consensus, Sherry, as just meeting the majority. But if I should say it that way. That's good, Chair. I have thought of It's really a majority. Any other comments on the evaluation? Well, if it's okay, then it would be an action item next month for us to adopt. Transportation report? And I gave you a copy, and, and if you remember right, when we were voting on Buses a year. Gosh, how long has it been? I don't know. But anyway, I, I've given you kind of a <coughs> projected budget. I think it came out, you know, pretty close to the, the budget. I think the second, the last page of the transportation report gives you the total district transportation cost, sort of. It's the actual cost of routes, activities wages, FICA, retirement, fuel, insurance, utility, and other. But certainly, you know, I'm not including the cost of what we spent to buy all those buses. You know, we did that out of the previous budget. And I don't know how to figure depreciation costs. I mean, there is some depreciation to all those vehicles, and I don't know how to estimate that. So these are just the costs that I that we accumulated as far as fuel. I didn't budget enough for fuel. I went by the price at the time, and I think we, we budgeted about 55000 for fuel, and we spent sixty nine. dollars We were under enough other areas that it didn't make that big of a factor, and so I know next year we need to budget you know, a little bit more. But uh, Bob Taylor did, I think, a great job of managing everything, and, and, and all the buses, we had very few repairs, a few minor repairs. Uh, those two brand new Thomas buses, you know, the one's got 24,000 miles and the other one 21 already. Doesn't take long, so. Uh, but. I got it. Woody's going to start giving this sheet out as a monthly report rather than that one that has so much stuff on it. I, I just never could read through that thing and I think this one's a little bit more clear and, and it's 
so our monthly reports can look a little bit different. But we kind of have it broke out into large buses and sped vehicles and activity vehicles. Of course, like the gray van is listed as a sped vehicle because during the day we use it for our success program, but then after 3.30 it's also an activity vehicle. So we don't list it both places. But and then the maintenance vehicles, we just have one at, at every building basically. They're not worth a lot to try to sell them, and there are times when we try to use them, we don't put a lot of miles on them, especially the van at the middle school, we put 117 miles on it in a year. You know, it's probably something that, we probably could take those four vehicles and just do liability insurance on them too. And maybe we have already, I'm not sure. But you can see our insurance costs for, our, for vehicles aren't very, isn't very much anyway. I had someone ask me the other day, none of these vehicles go home as employees, do they? <clears throat> Somebody might take a suburban home, like let's say, you know, Denise Kavon is driving to Omaha for an FCC LA thing or the next day or something, and, and she lives in Billigan, she might take it home the night before to leave from there. That would be the only, the only time something like that would happen. But other than that, no, we don't take any home. Looks like they all have full coverage before you just go on. Yeah. And, but again, the whole yeah. cost is really cost, really cost per vehicle. I guess we could save a little bit if we wanted to take them off. Uh, uh, I don't think it'd be that yeah. yeah. It's nice if you have to replace things, windshield or the old lights or whatever. So, so that's the transportation report. I don't know if you have any questions or not. Certainly going to use this document as I budget this year. It comes in pretty handy. Lynn did a great job of helping me get that ready. something I think I put it out for you today it's got a little A on the top and a B on the second page I never know what what budget items you want to see and what you don't want to see so I'm going to talk about the receipt side of our budget right now and that's that front page A so if you take a look at the first column this was our 2011-12 budget of receipts this is where I projected and all of them except for local property tax is a projection. This is what I projected as income. Uh, local property tax, the five million two thirty six is of course what we requested when we set the levy. Okay. And if you go to the bottom of that column, notice that the receipt totals are seven million two hundred fifty thousand. That's the amount of money I thought we would bring in. But our budget was seven million five seven. Well, probably every year except for this past year, I always budget the same amount of receipts as I do our total budget. But uh, we, a year ago, we decided we have $1.8 million in cash. There's no sense accumulating anymore. Because if you bring in, if we brought in $7.5 million in receipts and then only spent seven point two, million, then we're going to add 300000 back to our cash and we'll be at $2.1 million. So, when I, when I reseeded and asked for property taxes, I just did it by what I thought we would spend. And we always spend about 300000 under budget. So, you know, I asked for receipts for seven two fifty, but I budgeted for seven five seventy because if we did go over, over the receipts, we had plenty of cash to cover that. First year we've ever done it that way, but we've, we've accumulated cash for six years in a row and there was really no reason to do that, to do that anymore. Keep in mind we added another 500000 to to not spend. We put our cash reserve, some of it in our budget because that's what the Department of Ed recommended so that we didn't 
have a fiscal problem two or three years down the road. That middle column then is what we've received through June 30. And don't, don't confuse the first and the third lines. Local property tax, it looks like we've collected more than we asked for. Well, some of that is the third line down, public power district sales tax, but Lynn hasn't broken it out yet because it's kind of difficult to decipher and the auditor and her do that in September. They'll break it out in September of what was actually public, public power district sales tax and what was local property tax. He just doesn't take the time to, to break it out yet. So we haven't collected more. But, um, you know, that shows where we're at. And I'd say we're about on track. Uh, if you go down into state sources, wards of the court, that's the money we get back from operating the boys home. We're certainly way behind on that, but we always are. We should get another big check, probably August, and then in October or November, we'll get the check that finishes out this fiscal year. They're always like three months behind. So it, it's, it makes it a difficult situation, but I, I, they're usually pretty good. And Jackie Bernicaw helps us on the other end with that money, and if I tell her, hey, we're way short of money, she finds a way to, to get it to us. So um, I think we'll finish about on track. We've, we spent, last year, a year ago, we spent just under $7.3 in our budget. This year we're going to spend about $7.2 know, and, and so we're going to spend about $100,000 less this year than we did a year ago. That's my estimate at this time. But the reason for that is remember that we had stimulus money that they gave us the past two years that we had to spend. And we don't have that stimulus money this year. That went away, so that's probably why our expenditures are with us. In the last column, this is not set in stone yet, but this is what I'm thinking about, at least for a projected budget. The biggest change, of course, is state aid. We lose about 40000 in state aid. I got that highlighted in yellow. Everything else, I pretty much projected about the same, maybe a little bit higher for the boys' home. Uh, and that's about what we're going to need then in property taxes, somewhere around the 5.5 million. That would give us, that would put us at a receipts, that'd be receipts of 7.5 million. I would probably budget around 7.8, but again, we would normally only spend what we have receipts for. So we <coughs> normally have about a $300,000 cushion. And of course, you can always spend that cushion if you find a reason to spend it but then you'll be using some of your cash, so just so you keep that in mind. And then our other cash reserve, we would do that again. I talked to Janice at the Department of Ed, and she suggests that we continue to do that. It would give us a budget of about 8.3. And again, this isn't finalized. This is just my projection, you know, at this time. I haven't gone through the disbursement side a great deal because, again, we still have two months, July and August. And after claims tonight, we'll have pretty much July figured out and after payroll on the 20th, and so it'll just come down then to August disbursements. Under your federal sources, you're way behind on your title and idea. That all comes in towards the end of the year? Well, it's things that I have to file for, like Title I. We pay Title I, a <coughs> Title I teacher, a Title I aide, Title I classroom. <coughs> I have to file for that reimbursement. I usually wait till about the 1st of August and file for it. IDA, I filed for all of that, and they just approved part of it last week. So I know we have about 80000 coming in under IDA, and hopefully they'll approve the rest before August 30th. If they don't, it'll just add on to, to next year's receipts. But, but you're confident that those are the numbers? I mean, what was projected? Your yeah, budget. yeah. Well, they, yeah, absolutely. Title one, Title two. It looks like it's an II there, but Title two and IDA. Those numbers. We'll we'll get all that money. It's just a matter of me timing. filing for it. It's more a matter of timing. Okay. Medicaid, Medicaid administrative. Some years, Sherry will get forty thousand, and some years we'll get five. So I just kind of average out between. So at this point, those numbers are pretty much on track. I mean, yeah. Is that yeah, you just never know what you're going to get with those. You really don't. Other receipts, REAP money was 33000 That's what we use for part of our computer laptop initiative. That's the other receipts. Non-revenue, I had Lynn try to explain to me non-revenue sources today. 
I think this bill law stuff did they sale of property? That's sale of property. <laughs> Basically, it's things like you get you get hail on a car, insurance adjuster gives you a thousand dollars, you know, so that goes in other receipts. You may take that thousand and disperse it back by fixing the car, but it's something that's supposed to be kind of a break even. Same for sale of property, you make money on the property, but you gave up an asset, so it's considered to be non-revenue. I'm not sure on the other. Seems like a lot of the other there, but she could probably tell you. But it's not something you really count on to be a money maker because normally it's a trade even off the disbursement side. What is that? Board to the board? That That's basically it's for those students that are placed. Sometimes we get students placed in our school that are wards of the court also you get money that follows those, but for the, for the most part, the majority of that money comes from the boys, so it comes from Medicaid following the boys. Is there some reason the state can't deal directly with the state of the world? It's a long story, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we're taking it. I meet with them about every other year on it. I met with them, Lynn will tell you, I met with them at the end of June again. And anytime they get new people at the Department of Ed, the first thing they do is they notice this because we're the only school district in the state doing it this way. We are. We are the only one. And so they call and we have a meeting and every year we have an hour meeting and they just <coughs> throw their hands up and say let's just continue on because it's just kind you of mean a mess. The other places they pay the money directly to the homes? The other, the other schools are considered rule 18 schools, maybe like Geneva North is here. They, they right. operate their own school. Everything is funded right through them. This school, if, if we don't do it this way, then we bring those 15 to 20 boys in here and they go to school here. So that's the choice they're giving us. We do it that way or we bring them all in here. So they won't just make that a school out there? They won't. We've asked them to. The owner, the owner lives in Papillion. He doesn't want to. I think it's a cash windfall for him personally. Somehow, don't I don't I mean I don't know that I don't, don't quote me on that, but I'm just saying there's some benefit that he has to do it this way. There has to be, and uh, uh, I probably this is starting my eighth year. I probably I probably met with him four times on this. The owner in the Department of Ed, and it's always this is what they end up saying. That's your choice. They're out there. You pay, get reimbursed from words of the court, or you bring them in here. And I just don't think our parents and no. community would, would go for that. We're not really out anything. They're, they reimburse us. It's, they're behind always, but they do reimburse us. Mm -hmm. So anyway, then on uh, second page B, I just I put our three main non-general fund items. Our special building fund, the beginning, that means back to September 1st where it was. Our receipts, our disbursements, we just had our first one, I think, for the year. And then what our ending balance is. Keep in mind that they're working on our roof at the elementary now and there'll be some money there. And Remember we had the paving assessment. We've never been billed to that, so I'm not sure how they're doing the paving assessment, but we got to pay that out of there. We're doing lights and carpet here at the middle school this, this summer, and we'll get bills for that yet, probably. Sometimes, if if I have enough money left in general fund, I just pay it out of those building budgets too, and I don't I don't pay it out of building fund just because I, I think we want to accumulate that. Depreciation, that's what we use for vehicles, and so we spent a lot of that a year ago, and so the only receipts we've had right now is interest, but um, you know, I'm going to suggest to you in August that if we if we have to spend 7.2 million out of our budget, we have a 7.5 million dollar budget that we put maybe a hundred thousand in depreciation fund or fifty thousand or whatever you're comfortable with, and start building that back up. We are going to need we're always going to need vehicles. We're going to need to replace buses and whatever. And when you finish up your budget, that's a good way good way to do that. The QCAP fund. Uh, the beginning receipt, the beginning, the receipts, the disbursement, that's a fund we levy for. It was 2.2 cents this past year. The last payment is December of 2015. So the last levy would be the fall of 2014. Because 
really the levy we set is for the really the next year because we don't get those receipts until May and September, or at least the majority of them. And so we just need to get those receipts before the December payment. So we won't have to levy for that in in 2015 anymore. We should have enough in in the fund to make that last payment. I think it's 135,000. So. And one of our goals a couple years ago we talked about is that we didn't. We didn't want to have to use a QCAP fund anymore if we didn't have to. So it was to build the building fund up big enough to cover the roof and, and major things like when we redid the track for 90,000, the roof was anywhere between 170 and 250,000. So that was the goal of, of keeping our building fund kind of plus was that we wouldn't have to do the QCAP. Still do a QCAP. The interest rates are low or whatever, but certainly with our building fund, there is no interest if you if you accumulate enough money. Sometimes you know people see that oh they got half a million dollars in the building fund. What are they using that for? Well, you know it can go fast. One roof will <coughs> cut it in half. So um, one water meter is ten thousand. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I think I think financially, you know, we're setting we're setting very good. We're a non-state aid school anymore, and that used to be our largest next to property taxes. Our largest receipt was state aid, and now it's special education and wards of the court, other than our local property taxes. But we won't find valuations out until August 20. And I know there's some projections out, but ours always varies a little bit from Shipley's and extra millions because of the ethanol plant and the appreciation of the ethanol plant. So ours is not the same countywide as theirs, so I always have to wait until the 20th. I, I don't I don't I won't even give you an estimate. I don't have no idea until it comes out. So I will send you again whatever stuff you want. I'll, Lynn and I'll be working on the disbursement side in the next few weeks and we'll estimate that for you and I'll have an estimate about where we're going to end the year. Um, I'll certainly, as soon as valuations come out, I'll give you my thoughts on a, a levy estimate and whatever, and special building fund, whatever we want to do. I'm certainly the QCAP fund will fall a little bit this year. It's 2.2 this year. It'll probably be under two cents, I'm guessing. Special building fund, we've kept it four cents for about three years in a row. I don't really have an idea. Either. Questions? Board policy review 4154 and 4150. These were the only two. We did the 4000s. We did them over uh, three months. It took three months to get through the 4000s. And these were the only two that had check marks by them. And uh, so I don't know if any of you uh, checked these in particular and had anything on 4130, which is our teacher evaluation policy and procedure and then the second one was 4154 is our early retirement incentive program. And maybe we forgot one we checked them, but you know, I mean it could be and how often are you evaluating uh, Non-tenured teachers are twice a year, and I think tenured teachers are evaluated once every three years, although I require the principals to be, in, be walking through the classroom or sitting down in the classroom every semester in every room, so, uh, you know, it's not a formal evaluation, but, and if they have a tenured teacher that is on an improvement plan, then they're, they're doing evaluation every year. I think I actually checked this for that, for the three sure. years. I'm thinking, thinking three years is a long time yeah. for a tenure. I think maybe that's why they do and if you, yeah. and so But I think, it's I think one of those, if it's one of those three, let's say somebody's been here for six years, and they go on one of those improvement plans, and um, then they're going to get checked. 
every semester. At, at I mean, minimum, every and semester. Do they, they get reviewed then, or it's just they're going to they're update gonna, or uh, they'll get the full evaluation at yeah. each semester. Each semester, semester. Okay. then that's the minimum. They'll, they'll also be. I mean, if they're really on the improvement plan, then probably every two or three weeks we're doing a visit to the room or, mm -hmm. or something. But I, I think I think the nice thing about it, Jim is. I won't, I won't use names, but if you have a social studies teacher that's been here 30 years and is fantastic, you know, why are you gonna why are you gonna waste time every year being in that room for 50 minutes doing a full evaluation when you could be in a lot of places that that you're that you're needed? So it gives a little bit of discretion to the principals, but they're they're in the rooms all the time. They're supposed to be. Walkthroughs and sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's ten minutes. But the full evaluation is a period long. And for our non-tenured teachers, it's, it's 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 two times a year. For our tenured teachers, it's once a year. And I think it talks about it. Uh, tenured teacher, if they're on an improvement plan, maybe somewhere in here, but it might be a different. And the teacher evaluation instrument actually has to be adopted by the board, but it also has to be on file with the Department of Education and with your school attorney's office. So it's, 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 it's a variety of things there. So. Well, the, the Department of Ed is actually coming out with a new, and they're, they're working with some teachers. It's been about a three-year process. They're going to come out with a new <coughs> evaluation system for both teachers and principals. So it really, it really wouldn't do us a whole lot of good to make a whole lot of changes to anything right now because it's going to, it's going to all come out anyway. So on evaluation criteria, instructional performance, that means how they do in the room or how their how the kids' grade averages over a specific it period of time? It wouldn't have to do with grade average, but it might have to do with achievement test scores in that particular area. <coughs> so that would be Standardized it. test scores, because somebody could hand out awfully good grades and be a terrible teacher. Sure. So, I mean, so, grades yeah. is not so really it's more based on achievement tests. Grades is not really a good indicator of right. you know, instructional performance. Any further discussion? How about another retirement incentive program? Does anyone remember? Wasn't that the number? If it was open ended, somebody might have decided maybe it was a year. We can change it every year. I think. Yeah, right. I know, but I thought that that was why it was. The maximum it can be in the policy says is six. In the in the policy, the early retirement policy, it, it's six is the maximum you can accept. But then this part, it's you know, if you don't if you don't do anything, it's zero. So it's kind of like it's kind of an early retirement policy. Is that you don't really have to have one if you if you say it's going to be zero. You either vote to have zero or to make no action. Then, have, then you don't you have, have one that year. Right. Well, sorry. Yeah. Like so rather. Rather than abolish the policy one year and then a new board comes on and they want it, it's just allow the board now can set up where they want it. If you don't want any, then we set it as you want. So I, I like it personally. It gives you a lot of lot of power to do that each year too. So. Well we'll start then on the five thousand Next month. Okay. Okay. <coughs> the next item is facilities. I talked, and I apologize, I kind of dropped the ball. Thanks for the email, Sherry. Um, I talked to Kyle, and he said if we will um, look at our calendars and maybe give him three or four possibilities um, in the next couple of weeks, uh, he suggested five o'clock. So I will email you tomorrow and you can send them back to me or 
Okay. And then we'll I'll contact that. Do you want to be in the world? I can. It's up to you. I'll send you a signal. Kyle's going to be there. I'll be there. Well, I think Rod's going to be there. It's basically for Rod is always with those two. As far as the science rooms, I'm going to have uh, Mitch is here tonight, but Mitch and Dave Segerman and Mr. Rose and uh, our architect are going to get together and kind of come out with a plan or an equipment list or how they'd like to see it and maybe an approximate approximate cost and then we'll present that to the board and the board can you know, decide the direction they want to go on, on that also. But we'll do that once we get back into school about the middle of August. So I don't know if we'll have it by the August board meeting, but we'll certainly have it by the September board meeting. So. Thank you. Thank you. The next meeting is set for Monday, August 20th. Is that okay with you? Do that August meeting a week later, just so we can kind of finish the fiscal year and pay as many many things as we can get paid off to start the new fiscal year. So, okay. We need a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Roll call. One yes. Oshner. Yes. Donnan. Yes. Kleinschmidt. Yes. Lightning. Yes. 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 Y